in an islet transplant, you're replacing, if you will, the beta cells that have been damaged by autoimmunity. And it's important to remember that an islet, it's a multicellular structure. You might say, well, why don't we just give them back the beta cells? But we've shown that, in fact, you need the, the intact islet the four cell types within the islet for good glucose control. The alpha cell talks to the beta cells, talk to the, the PP cells, talk to the somatostatin cell. So it's a multicellular structure. You have a, what they call a paracrine control, if you will, that actually maintain the blood sugar. So for good glucose control, you need the intact islet with the four cell types. And so when we give these islets back to the patient, uh, that's why we're able to stop the insulin. Uh, is because this multicellular structure works as a unit. It not only senses changes in glucose, but secretes the appropriate hormones to maintain good glucose control. So one of the attractions in islet transplant, as compared to say a pancreas transplant, it's a much simpler procedure. Both do the same thing. You know, you're giving back to the patient insulin producing cells or beta cells. In the pancreas transplant, it's a much bigger surgical procedure and with some complication, especially with the pancreatic duct. What do you do with the digestive enzymes that the, the acinar cells secrete? When we talk about an islet transplant, so what we've done is we've got rid of 95% of the pancreas. We have just these small volume of cells, islets if you will, very small. The patient comes into the x-ray department or the radiology department. It's not even asleep and the radiologist puts a long needle through the side, finds the portal vein, they just thread a little catheter up in there and, and then they just go in and they just inject the islets and they travel up the portal circulation to the smaller blood vessel and eventually they get stuck, if you will, in the small blood vessels. They sense changes in glucose and the beta cells or the alpha cells or the other cell types secrete the appropriate hormones to maintain a person's blood sugar within the normal, uh, normal range. Over the years, many sites have been looked at, such as, you know, in the pancreas, beneath the kidney capsule, into the liver. Uh, now the problem is going back into the pancreas is as so, soon as you stop the circulation of the pancreas, it digests itself, the acid component, and it destroys all the cells. And so because 95% to 98% of the pancreas is made up of these acinar cells, if you injected the islets up into the pancreas, they would digest them. So we have found that in fact, you, it's important to have what I call portal drainage. When the blood supply goes from the pancreas, the circulation goes into the portal circulation. So we call first pass insulin. It goes up into the liver, and plus it's easy access for transplantation. But, other, you know, but we're continuing to look at other sites to transplant the islets. But to this point in time, the liver seems to be the ideal site. It's simple surgically, and also uh, when the islets secrete their insulin, it, uh, it's secreted right into the liver, which is what happens when you, the insulin is secreted from the pancreas, and it gives a better physiological control. I think many healthcare professionals are somewhat reluctant to refer patients for consideration of islet transplantation, partly because they're unsure about its safety, they're unsure about its effectiveness, and I think they also are perhaps under the perception that it's for special patients or different patients or not for patients that they might be seeing. I think we have quite a robust assessment process and we would generally encourage people to refer patients. We're happy for people to be referred and for us to assess them and say, you know, this isn't right for them or not yet, rather than people kind of assuming that the answer is going to be no and not asking the question. So I think that the people that will benefit most from islet transplantation are people who are having frequent recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia, particularly if they're complicated by hypoglycemia unawareness. However, there will also be people who have erratic, variable, uncontrolled blood sugar levels that we would also consider for transplantation. I think the other group of people that we, we see are people who have previously had problems with severe hypoglycemia and who are deliberately running the blood sugars higher in an effort to avoid hypoglycemia. So they may not be currently having hypoglycemic episodes, but they're running with an A1C of 9% or higher. They may be developing 
complications and that any effort to try to improve the glycemic control to avoid those complications will be accompanied by recurrent frequent severe hypoglycemia. So those, I think, are the people that we would be most interested to, to treat. In general, we don't accept people for islet transplant who've got advanced renal failure. So if the creatinine is you know, above 200, if the GFR is below 30, we probably would not take those people for islet transplant because the risks of them going on to need a kidney transplant are quite high and we wouldn't want to provoke or induce kidney failure because the anti-rejection drugs we use. And so for some of those people, they may be better to wait for a kidney transplant, possibly combined with a pancreas at the same time. So those would be people that we perhaps would not be, be sure about. But certainly we are delighted and happy to be asked to consider people for transplant. And often we can make a judgment from the referral letter as to whether this is something that we should explore further or whether this is something that should be redirected to another destination.